Hello, everybody, to our uh, webinar this afternoon. Um, hello, everybody, to a uh, special job to be done webinar on the second job to be done summit in Europe. This is a teaser webinar, as we announced. Um, it should uh, give you an outlook and a short teaser on what will be uh, the topics at the Job to be Done Summit. At the same time, it gives you a full introduction into the Job to be Done and Outcome Driven Innovation Framework. It's a special viewpoint, something that we are uh, communicating today um, that will only be launched, uh, so to say, to the world. Um, at this summit event, and we will give you a first glance on this. It is about how to discover new markets to grow a business, to grow an existing business. How to discover new markets, and especially in the uh, existing times that we have where companies really struggle, um, find new ways uh, to create value for um, the communities. Um, this will be a very interesting talk and discussion. Um, let me um, say hello to, my name is Martin, you know, uh, me as a moderator, uh, most probably already. And let me uh, introduce you to Tony, Anthony Aldick. Uh, he is also in the call with us and he will bring in uh, his latest uh, thinking uh, when it comes to discovering, uncovering new markets, new revenue streams, um, Based on job to be done thinking. Hello, Tony. Okay. Um. Good. Let's go ahead. Uh, the agenda for this afternoon is um, I will give you a short um, summary of what is jobs to be done at all, what is uh, uh, the power of it. Uh, and yeah, I see your messages. Uh, sound is better, sound has improved. Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, uh, the outcome driven innovation framework. Um, then Tony will come in with his part. And at the end, we will have a short QA. Um, and an outlook to the Job to be Done Summit in June. Now, uh, having said that, uh, I would like to start off with this uh, very plain question, how to innovate? And as an example, how to innovate a banana? This is a very um, typical question that we face in companies and organizations. We need to innovate and we need to innovate something that we already do. Um, and if we would be a banana company, uh, now, yeah, we would uh, wonder how can we innovate the products that we sell. Now, if you spend five seconds to think about this question, uh, what pops up into your mind? What ideas uh, do you uh, get uh, right away as innovators? Uh, I think you get a lot of ideas. Please keep them for yourself for the time being. Um, and uh, then we will we will we will have another look at this uh, example at the end of the webinar. Um, uh, so how to innovate the banana? Um, the, the the tricky thing here is uh, you want to resolve an equation, um, and this is our definition of innovation: a very short and very pragmatic definition, uh, just in one line. It's a function. Innovation is a solution for a need. And uh, if you are clear about that, uh, it's clear that we need to, first of all, find out the needs and find the need that is most relevant and not very well served. And then we need to create solutions by using all of our creativity. And we don't want to do this uh, as a one-time shot to have success with it. But uh, ultimately, as an organization, we want to uh, have a process in place of devising such, such solutions that address unmet customer needs on an ongoing basis. Now, having said that, um, uh, this um, this uh, this whole exercise is being supported uh, with job to be done thinking, and uh, it starts uh, it started way back in the sixties of the last century, uh, where Theodore Levitt um, uh, coined the term "people don't want a quarter inch drill; they want a quarter inch hole." This should reflect. Um, the way of thinking when you think about jobs to be done. 
Uh, when you want to innovate the drill, you should probably not think about the drill and what you can improve on a drill, on the solution itself, but rather argue and, um, and question what is the drill being used for and what is it that people want to achieve when they use such a drill. Now, uh, this should highlight that um, uh, job to be done thinking really changes the perspective. And ultimately, it's a change of perspective that we have here when we talk about jobs to be done. Now, uh, there are three, uh, three, three uh, consequences out of it. First of all, people buy products and services only to get a job done. So if people buy something, it's that there is something underlying, something uh, higher purpose uh, why people buy a product. It's to get a job done. Second of all, this job uh, and not the product itself or the customer as a person uh, shall be the unit of analysis. So we shall analyze the job to be done uh, to start our, our, our innovation initiatives. And this job lens brings a new perspective to strategy and innovation. Uh, what we are uh, talking about here, uh, there is a lot of publications out there. Uh, there are two books that I want to highlight here. It's from Tony, um, from Tony Alvik, um, What Customers Want uh, and Jobs to be Done, uh, Theory to Practice. There are also other uh, publications um, and we are very happy to share um, uh, those those books, the, the jobs to be done book, as is, is, is a free audio book and an ebook. Uh, when you when you move to edisoninnovation.com or strategy.com, um, where you find uh, uh, a lot of uh, resources when it comes to publications. Uh, it's not only theory; it's uh, it's practice, and um, this way of thinking has been applied in many different industries over the last thirty years. Um, and uh, there are a lot of case examples uh, that uh, we are also happy to share with you. And by the way, this is what what's happening in the Job to be Done Summit, that many companies from different industries will tell their stories and how they apply this way of thinking to grow their business. Now, uh, having said that, uh, let's come back to the innovation question and how to really opera operationalize it with outcome-driven innovation. How to innovate the music streaming service could be another question when it comes to innovation. And it's uh, probably not as simple as a banana, as a product. Um, it's a little bit more complex to create the music streaming service or even innovate the music streaming service. Everybody can imagine that. But I'm quite sure that you, uh, as you're listening uh, to this uh, webinar, you will initially have the one or the other the idea as well on what can be improved when it comes to music streaming. Um, and as we don't want to leave this way of thinking up to, um, so to say, up to, up to good luck, we have created this framework that really puts it into a manageable practice, uh, this whole innovation process. And it's uh, a five-step process. It co it's called outcome-driven innovation. And I want to highlight these five steps now, this five-step uh, innovation process and strategy process, ultimately product strategy process, um, based on this uh, music streaming example. So the first step here is to define the market. Uh, the second step then is to uncover the customer needs uh, tied to a job to be done. In the third step, you want to quantify your insights. You want to get quantitative insights. Uh, you want to then discover hidden segments of opportunity, segment the market based on the true needs profiles. And finally, you want to use this data model to formulate um, a product strategy and a service strategy. Now, let's go back to step number one, defining the market. Uh, when it comes to uh, a product like a streaming, market or the streaming service, it's a product. It's ultimately a product category. And uh, you can see also other product categories um, when it comes to the music industry, like LPs, CDs, MP3s, and so on. Um, and um, markets are often defined around such product categories. When you uh, innovate and when you apply job-to-be-done thinking, you ask yourself, what is the 
what is the reason why people are using these different kinds of technologies and products? What is it ultimately that people want to achieve when using these solutions? And you will very fast, you will realize, yes, this is about listening to music. And that's uh, ultimately the job to be done um, that people want to get done when they use one of these solutions. And uh, by, by uh, defining a market around the job to be done, like in this case, listening to music, uh, you get a very stable market definition uh, that will be the same also in the future, even if um, a product category will fade and will be replaced by other products or technologies, the underlying job to be done um, will stay the same. So you have uh, uh, the first part in this equation, the need part, um, already almost fixed. What you then want to, uh, of course, understand is uh, what goes wrong when listening to music and then you uh, drill deeper uh, here. But the first exercise here is to understand the market that you're in when you talk about streaming music. And a market um, in the job to be done philosophy shall always be defined as a group of people and the job they are trying to get done. Now, this is the first question, the first guiding question for all of us and uh, for you who, 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 are, who are interested in how to innovate your businesses. The first question is, whom do you want to create value for? Whom do you want to create value for? What is the group of people that you want to create value for? And second of all, what is the job to be done of that executor? We call a customer typically a job executor that you want to create value for. So what is the job to be done? In this music example, that's rather easy. It's music enthusiasts that want to listen to music. Now, um, Tony will go more into this discussion later on when he uh, will highlight ways to, uh, to practice and to approach that and to really find new groups of executors and new jobs to be done uh, that you can create value for and ultimately uh, create new business out of that. I would like to uh, go into more detail now uh, with the second step. Once we have understood what the market is that we are in, um, uh, based on the job to be done and the group of people that we want to create value for, we can start to analyze that job and we can analyze it in all of its details. What we do here is job mapping. Uh, and every job can be mapped out in typically eight steps. So what we are trying to find out here and analyze here is what is the ideal uh, the ideal process of getting that job done? What is the ideal process of listening to music? What is it that people want to achieve when they um, when they want to listen to music? So this is a process model. It, it comes out of uh, Six Sigma thinking, and it defines the job to be done in its ideal format in its ideal way. And by defining a job in its ideal format, based on an ideal process, um, you get a model that is stable over time and uh, even stable over time when technologies and solutions will change. Now, when you look at such a job map for listening to music, you can now start to map also solutions against that job to be done. And you will realize that certain solutions uh, typically only support um, a limited um, number of steps in a job to be done. So um, an MP3 player would uh, support here some selected steps out of the whole job of listening to music, while a music streaming service already gets more of the job done and probably also gets it done better. Uh, so the ultimate strategy outlook that you already get when creating such a job map for the job that you want to serve is that you can you can already derive a long-term development strategy for your organization by um, asking uh, how can you get the whole job done from the viewpoint of the customer how can you get the whole job done better and cheaper and what kind of solutions and solution platforms would you need to uh, create to make that happen so now this gives us already an outlook of how to innovate um, the music streaming service and uh, the future streaming services mo most probably will get all of the job done and not only parts of it and it will get it done better and cheaper and even better than today. Now we want to know 
uh, what does it mean better than today? So what exactly do we need to improve now when it comes to a music streaming service? And here we wanna drill deeper and understand how can a job um, uh, get done better? And there is only three ways to get a job done better. It's get the job done faster from the viewpoint of the customer, uh, make it more predictable, less errors, less variability, and get a higher output and a higher throughput when getting the job done. This is very, very functional, I have to admit. There are also emotional elements in it, uh, but we do not want to go into all these uh, uh, dimensions now in this short webinar. I, I just wanna focus on the core of it here on the, on the outcomes. Um, now, um, you can you can drill down now this, this core functional job in its steps and each job step um, um, will have desired outcomes. So people want to get all of the job steps faster and with uh, less variability and uh, with higher efficiency. Uh, to give you an example uh, how this will uh, will sound then and how will this read then, um, uh, when you look at uh, the job of listening to music, for example, people want to minimize the time it takes to determine how much music will be needed. Um, this is a desired outcome uh, when getting the job done and it's an outcome tied to the first step of this job um, when you assess the situation and when you plan uh, your experience. So you wanna minimize the time it takes to determine how much music will be needed. Another outcome uh, of that job would be that people want to minimize the time it takes to determine what songs to include. Uh, and this is an outcome statement tied to the uh, another step of the job on gather the desired music. Uh, and it goes on like this. Uh, here's another statement uh, out of the execution part in its core. When people really listen to music, they wanna minimize the likelihood that the music sounds distorted when played at high volume. Uh, and you will get way more such statements when you have uh, a few discussions with uh, customers, with uh, people who listen to music, and they will tell you a lot of stuff. What you should um, do here is to bring it all down uh, to this uh, to this um, formulation of minimizing something, minimizing the time, minimizing the likelihood uh, of something happening, uh, because then it gets really operational. When you uh, read through these statements, and I show you now a short list on um, some more examples of uh, listening to music and outcomes related to that job, you can see that each of these needs, these are the core needs that people have, functional needs that they have, they are all very, very operational. Um, so you can run with a design team through these statements um, and uh, give this as a briefing for, um, uh, for design uh, tasks and creativity workshops. And you will find very fast um, solutions that exactly address the need and uh, the need is very pretty much measurable and operationalized. Uh, what you can see here in this, uh, um, in, in this graph is that solutions are measured uh, against how well they can address these outcomes. And there are solutions that cannot very well address each of those outcomes, and then there are other solutions that can address it better. Typically, and this is the evolution of every business, of every market, uh, future solutions have to get the job done better measurably better than existing solutions if they want to be successful in the market. So ultimately, every solution will be judged by customers uh, against uh, how fast can they help to get a job done, um, how, how, how good are they in, in avoiding any errors in getting the job done and improving the throughput and the efficiency of getting the job done. You may, you may test this out on, 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 on products that you like um, and ask yourself, what is the product doing for me, helping me get a job done faster or, um, or, or better in terms of less errors? Now, this is the, are the most important two steps in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the ODI process because here you create the whole needs model and you want to understand each and every need, each and every outcome that is tied to this selected job to be done. Once you have that, um, the other steps are rather easy, I would say because now you can 
put that into a list, into a questionnaire, all these outcome statements, all these need statements, and ask customers, job executors, uh, for their voting, for their rating. And you want to know from them how important each of these need is and how satisfied they are in getting it done uh, with the solutions that they currently use. Um, based on that data, uh, you get an opportunity landscape, as we call it. Uh, so it's uh, uh, a lot of dots on this graph that you can see here. Each dot is a outcome, is, is a selected outcome, a need statement. And you get all these outcomes now on these two dimensions, importance and satisfaction. Now, those needs, those outcomes that are extremely important on the very right-hand side of that graph, and at the same time, not very well satisfied, satisfaction is low, these are underserved needs and these are the highest opportunities for innovation. So here you can create value um, when you uh, find solutions that get measurably, get these outcomes, um, uh, help, help customers achieving these outcomes better. On the other hand, you will also find needs that are not important to the majority of the customers and already very well served. Um, now, these are overserved needs, and guess what? Here you might think about disruptive innovation and coming up with solutions that are cheaper and good enough. Once you have the data in place, uh, you can use that data with statistical methods uh, to find out patterns, um, groups of customers that have similar needs patterns. Uh, based on this data that you got from these questionnaires. Um, and this is just an example, a schematic example, how um, these needs groups can look like um, in, in, in a market. Now in this market here, if that was the music market, you would see that 33% of all the customers are extremely challenged. They have all their needs on the right hand side and on the, on the, on the, on the lower end of that opportunity landscape. So this is a challenged group of uh, customers, while you find other 15% of respondents, of customers um, on the very left-hand side, where all the needs from their point of view are not important and very well served already. So um, having said that, if you, if you use this data, you can find the true uh, needs-based segmentation of a market. Um, and you can see that it's the same need most probably, but for one group of customers, it's extremely important and not very well served, like minimize the likelihood that the music sounds distorted, while for another group of customers, it's extremely overserved with existing solutions. And once this one is in place, uh, you have the basis uh, to create your growth strategy, your winning growth strategy, and having said that, to align the whole organization to create a common growth strategy that works. Um, starting with the opportunity that you have found in the market, that you have validated quantitatively, where you exactly know how big the group of customers is that have a very high underserved need. Starting with that opportunity, you may have started a discussion in your corporation, in your organization, on what would be the right communication measures what would be the right product innovation measures? Uh, what can be done on the digital and service innovation part? Um, and do we need to have a new platform or a new business model uh, to really come up with a system solution that um, addresses the opportunity that you found in the market? Now, and all these plus signs here uh, should, should highlight that this need statements uh, can align a whole organization and uh, deliver a common understanding on what is the most important unmet need. And if you achieve that one, you can really power up a whole organization. Um, this would have been my take on it uh, to show you the five steps of the ODI process. And many of you will probably now ask, uh, um, okay, but how to start with it? and how to find now the right market definition and how to find especially new markets to create new revenue streams for an organization. And I would like to hand over now to Tony to guide you through the latest thinking um, that we have in that respect. Now, uh, Tony, this is your stage.
you know. Uh, thanks everyone for being here today. I certainly appreciate it. Um, what we wanted to cover was um, something that I think is pretty pertinent, you know, given the fact that um, you know, companies are struggling in certain ways, uh, especially right now. Uh, one of the things that executives have been telling us is that they are looking to find new revenue streams and looking to do it quickly. So uh, what I thought I would do here today is to just talk about how uh, the jobs framework could be used to address this particular need. So we'll go into a bit of detail here on, on all of this. Um, as Martin was explaining, you know, we think of everything through a little different lens. So we're gonna put on the jobs to be done lens when we're thinking about uh, market definition in adjacent markets, as you'll see. So we're not gonna talk about us being in the drill market. I mean, we're gonna be in the creating the quarter inch hole market. So um, let me work. All right, so what we're gonna dig down into is this first step, all right? We wanted to find a market, but it's not the market that we're in. We're gonna define adjacent markets and um, hopefully markets that will be attractive for us to pursue. All right, so um, a market again is a group of people and the job they're trying to get done, right? So it's always in this format, the group of people plus the job they're trying to execute. The group of people trying to execute a job. And the job's always defined as a process so we can break it down with the job map and put outcomes up against it. So we have a series of these and there may be many of you out there that are product strategists trying to formulate a product strategy as well. So when we start defining our market, um, typically what we tell people is you want to define your core market broadly and that most products only get part of a job done. And if you're trying to grow in your core market, you want to know what the entire job is so you can grow over time. So the kettle maker could become the uh, Nespresso of the future. But of course, this takes a lot of time. So when we define the market for purposes of discovering adjacencies, uh, especially today, we don't have the luxury of time. What we want to do is to figure out how do we take our current technology and apply it in different ways uh, to uh, generate revenue. That's really the question we're trying to answer here. So we have a little different rule set um, that we're going to introduce today uh, that we ask that you apply uh, to do this successfully. So when we define a market for core market growth, we generally ask, like I said, what job is the customer trying to get done? But what we're going to do here today in defining your adjacent markets, we're going to ask the question, what job does my product or technology do? And again, the reason we're doing this is because we want to get a narrow focus that describes your current capability so that you can point that current capability in other directions immediately to generate new revenue streams. Again, we don't have the luxury of time, so we're trying to figure out how can we do this in the most uh, expedient fashion. So this is the recommendation. Define your core market around the technology um, that uh, the job that your technology or that your product does. So let's use an example here. You know, what market is this company in here? This is very interesting. Uh, we were talking with this company recently. Um, they uh, make a, a phone for the hearing impaired that um, transcripts or transcribes, I should say, the um, audio content in real time so they can have a conversation with, um, with another party. So when we think about the market here, of course, we're not gonna define it as the phone market or the transcription market, right? We're going to define it as the hearing impaired. And notice how we're defining the core job here. We're not saying that the hearing impaired trying to engage in a verbal conversation, uh, which we could, but that's a bit broader job. And their technology really doesn't help them get that broader job done. If they want to grow their core market, they could grow in that direction over the coming years, and that would be a nice path for growth. However, um, in the immediate term, what they want to do is to focus on what their technology does, consume audio content as text in real time. That's the job that the technology or the product gets done, and that's their core capability and what they can control and what they can point in different directions. Okay, so let's move from there. So once we know what the core market is, then we can define an adjacent market. 
And I always find this interesting because companies always talk about adjacent markets, but we have to ask adjacent to what? It has to be adjacent to something and we have to define what that something is. So we're saying the something is the core market that's defined around what job the product or technology gets done. And then we're going to define adjacent markets as markets that include either that current executor or that current job to be done. So let me show you the framework that we've created to uh, simplify this. Think of it like this. You have your current executor getting the current job done. That's your core. Right? And again, we're defining the core as the job that your technology gets done. And from here, we can start looking at the adjacencies. Adjacencies might mean that you can um, help the current executor get more jobs done or new jobs, you know, more jobs than your core. Or the other possibility of going in the other direction is that you can find different job executors to get the same job done. You know, are there other people who are trying to get the same job done other than the people you're currently looking at? And then of course, there's new markets as well. Now new markets um, rely on a new executor and a new job. And they're generally higher risk for the organization. Uh, the beauty of the uh, adjacent markets is that uh, going up, you, you already have a relationship with the job executor. So helping them get more jobs done uh, requires uh, not more relationship building necessarily, but a, a different twist on the product or service that you're offering. Uh, going in the other direction, uh, you're already getting a core job done. You have the technology that uh, can be very effective in that space. Who else can benefit from that technology? So now when we look at a new market though, um, and I'm gonna give you an example here of how it's tricky sometimes to think about the difference between the adjacencies and the new and how you can get yourself in a trap if, if you um, define them inaccurately. So let me do that. I wanna go back to an example uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, we worked with uh, a company a number of years back called OnTrack. Now OnTrack, um, helps IT specialists recover data from a hard drive. So if you've ever had a hard drive failure, you would go to OnTrack, they would take your hard drive, retrieve the data from it and give it back to you so you could put it, you know, store it again safely on a, on a working device. So um, they were, you know, excellent in this field and they had this capability and they thought, well, let us go after an adjacent market. So here's what they thought, they said, we want to go into the electronic evidence discovery business because here again, IT specialists will retrieve data from a hard drive and then they'll go give it to the legal team for use. So what they were assuming is that the IT manager was going to be the job executor and they view this as an adjacent market. And thinking of it this way, they actually failed twice in their first two attempts to enter the market. And they really couldn't understand why they failed. Uh, Alan gave us a call and said, uh, you know, come figure this out for us and see what you think, use your framework. So the very first thing we did is to figure out, well, who is the job executor and what's the job? And as it turns out, it was a new market that they were going after, not a, a, an adjacent market. Because what happened is the job executor changed. While the IT manager might actually get the data off a hard drive, um, what they're doing with it is giving it to a legal team to get a bigger job done, a different job done, to discover information that supports or refutes a case. So once they recognize this, then they could make the corrections they needed to be successful. So they recognized, yes, we're in a new market. We have a new job executor, the legal team. We have a new job to be done. It's not just get the data off the hard drive, it's to discover facts that support or refute a case. So what we did is we built out their job map. Uh, and here, this happened to be nine steps. Sometimes job maps are up to 20 steps, but they all have the same kinds of uh, inputs. And what they discovered from this job map was that all they were doing uh, initially was the first two steps in the job. They were identifying the sources of data and they were capturing the information. And then they would give it to the IT person and the IT person would give it to the legal team and that they had no idea what to do with it because what they're trying to do is to discover information that supports or refutes the case. So what Kroll was able to do was then to integrate tools into their uh, offering that would help prepare the data for analysis, 
help them discover data that's relevant to the case, analyze it, verify it, assess the impact on the case, and distribute that information to the legal teams. And once they were able to get that entire job done, uh, they were very successful and they're still leading in this market, electronic discovery today. So um, that was one uh, interesting story. Now, what I wanna do is to go back to, how do you discover your adjacencies, all right? So we have an exercise that you can go through. Um, it's three steps, it's like this. First, define your core market. Who are the job executors you're trying to um, create value for? And what is the job that your technology is getting done in this space, okay? Once we have that, we can look for adjacencies in both directions. We can say, all right, what other jobs are parents trying to get done? They're trying to pass on life lessons to children, but what else are they trying to do? Are they trying to uh, build their cognitive skills? Are they trying to uh, help them with their homework? Are they, and of course, you know, there's hundreds of jobs that parents are trying to get done with their children. So looking at those adjacent jobs and ones that might be most attractive to you would be a reasonable uh, approach for adjacent market discovery. Now going in the other direction, we can ask what other job executors are trying to pass on life lessons to children? And of course, it's not just parents, it could be grandparents, it could be teachers, it could be mentors, it could be coaches. Uh, and you see that the door opens up to thinking about other executors who are trying to get the exact same job done. So if you're, you had a technology that could pass on life lessons to children, you could start deploying it in multiple places, not just focusing on parents. So that's one example. Another here, same format. We have business professionals who are trying to prepare for the next stage in a career. So same exercise business professionals, what other jobs are business professionals trying to get done? Yes, they're trying to prepare for advancement in their career. What else are they trying to do? Are they trying to achieve a, a good life balance, uh, work life balance? Uh, of course, there's dozens of jobs that they're trying to get done and understanding what those jobs are and seeing if uh, you have the capabilities to address them, again, would be a reasonable uh, focus for discovering adjacent markets. And again, you can go in the other direction and ask, are there other job executors other than business professionals who are trying to prepare for the next stage in a career? And from there, you could expand it beyond business professionals to be uh, technical people. You know, it could be anyone who's trying to advance in their growth in their business. And we have one more example here as well the hearing impaired, consuming audio content as text in real time. This is what this client learned uh, you know, about doing, uh, about using this approach. We worked on it like this. We said, what other jobs can the hearing impaired, uh, what jobs are they trying to get done? And we came up with our list and then we went in the other direction and we said, are there other executors trying to get the same job done? And here again, you know, in what are the situations are people trying to consume audio content as text in real time? Uh, subtitles on any movie or any show, of course, would be another uh, possibility. And again, we just, we put together a list of, of um, possibilities. And I want to make another point here. Um, in most of these exercises that we've done, companies generally find direction to be more attractive, less risky than the other. Uh, in other words, you know, they, they may, it may be easier for them to find lots of applications for their core technology, focus on new executors, or it may be easier for them to just add features to the current platform to get more jobs done. So e even discovering that is very effective. Uh, in the exercises we take clients through, then we ask them, you know, what are some recent markets that you tried to enter and tell us how successful you were? And they can pinpoint which quadrant, which part of the quadrant they were in, and tell a story. And nine times out of ten, you know, those stories where they focused on the adjacencies, they were successful. And when they ended up in the new market, unbeknownst to them, uh, they would uh, generally fail. Lots, much higher rates going in that quadrant. So that's a fun exercise to go through as well, and I would recommend that.
Now, the last piece of this, of course, you have your list of, of possible adjacent markets. How do we evaluate them? So we've created a tool. Um, it's, it's been around for a while, actually. Uh, and it's available on a Strategy Resource Center website. Uh, and it goes into all these criteria that you can use to decide uh, the attractiveness of one or the other. But there's a few basic ones that I think uh, make a lot of sense. So for example, the number of job executors. Is the market, you know, does it consist of 3,000 job executors or 300,000 job executors? You know, which one would be more attractive? And clearly, if there's more executors, that would be positive. Uh, what about the rate of growth of jobs executors? You know, is the population increasing? Is the population of executors decreasing over time? Uh, the frequency of job execution. Is it a job they get done uh, once a year or is it something they execute five times a day? And of course, if, if, it's, if you're picking on a market that has lots of executors, the pool of executors is growing, the frequency of job executors is great, the percent of underserved customers is high, they're willing to pay more to get the job done better, and uh, the market is highly underserved, that would be a very attractive market. So those are some of the criteria we're suggesting that you look at when you're going through the evaluation phase. And again, I think there's 41 or two criteria. They go into lots of detail into the consumption of the product as well um, um, model. As, you know, you can enter markets and win uh, through consumption, not even getting the core job done better, but making it easier to use, making it uh, easier to purchase, and you know, improving the customer journey along the uh, the product life. So um, there you have it. What I wanted to finish up with is a uh, here to do any online workshops. Uh, I know we're all working remote these days, so uh, we've created a format of this so that we can spend you know, an hour or two hours or day with your team, whatever it takes to walk you through this entire exercise, uh, correctly defining the core markets, discovering the potential adjacent markets, uh, figuring out which pathway is more true to you, should you go horizontally or vertically, uh, figuring out what the options are in them, the using criteria that we're talking about. And of course, you know, picking that most effective market for pursuit. And then once you've picked the market, uh, you've completed step one in the ODI process. And as Martin demonstrated, you can go through the rest of the process to figure out what the customer's needs are, uh, where they're underserved, um, how their segments of people with different um, needs, and use all those insights to help guide your success. Uh, in the, uh, in the market that you've chosen. I wanted to also point out that uh, we've uh, recently introduced our online education certification packages, uh, white belt, green belt courses. Uh, there's three courses, uh, discovering the job to be done, uh, uncovering customer needs and creating the survey. So these are now available. Uh, might be a great time to get um, expert on ODI uh, insights. Um, for your use as well at uh, mind.strategy.com. Now, I'll leave it at that. Uh, Martin, I'll turn it back over to you. Hi, Tony. Thanks a lot for your uh, great uh, talk and thoughts, uh, inspiring thoughts. Um, now, uh, this would be uh, the point in time that, that we can use for a short Q&A. Um, and um, having said that, uh, everybody can also type uh, their questions. I will read uh, in the chat here uh, and pick the one or the other question. Um, and um, we will answer every question. So if you bring in now questions into the chat, we will, we will take them and give you feedback to your questions also after the webinar. Now, it would be possible to directly give us your thoughts and, and questions, and I will um, and I will uh, read them out and, um, and ask Tony um, uh, your questions right away in the next uh, few minutes. Um, now, yeah, I see the first, uh, the first question coming in. What kind of questions should you be asking to truly uncover outcomes? How do you guide the interview basically? Tony. Okay, well, I, I'd love to answer that because um, I do have my favorite approach and um, it sounds simple and has a simple people tend to uh, away from the, the line of questioning but whether you're defining not to be done the job map or the outcomes what we're really trying to figure out is what are you trying to accomplish 
So please define the core job, which we basically ask, you know, so you try job. At that level, we go to the job level and we break out the job steps. What are you trying to accomplish first? Then what's the next thing to accomplish? And so on, based on the model, which suggests that there's a planning phase and gather the inputs and so on based on universal job map. And then when we get to the outcome phase, we do the thing. We go step by step in the job and say, what's the first thing you're trying to accomplish when X step one of the job? What's the next thing you will accomplish? And what we're listening for are, um, you know, what are they trying to achieve? And what are they trying to wait? Because basically they're trying to get the job done faster, more predictably, higher output throughput. So we're looking for inputs that we can put in our outcome format. And there's just you stay outcomes. Minimize the time it you do something in a certain text, and minimize that something bad happens in a certain context. So if we keep everything very simple like that, we're able to capture a pretty good set of needs fairly quickly. And uh, the other thing I wanted to mention here too is uh, I really like doing what I call immersions because it's very hard to train customers to give you good inputs. Uh, in fact, in interviews, uh, the interviewer or the customer don't know what outputs you're looking for. It makes for a really interesting conversation. We try to flip that around. So we know exactly what kind of outputs we're looking for, outcome statements in the desired format. And we work with the team of customers for maybe four to six hours. And this may be a group of four to six people and we work to build out the job map and the set of outcomes. What we find is that after about a half hour, an hour or so to it, they begin thinking about outcomes in our outcome language because they're trying to be helpful and trying to give us the kind of inputs we need. And what we're doing is, doing is we're showing them the kind of inputs we need. We're capturing them in real time. They get to view them. So they get to critique and uh, validate them. And through that process, they're learning what a good outcome is and how to give us good inputs. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, thank you, Tony. There's another question uh, that I have here and I just want to pu put it in maybe for a minute. Uh, what if I have, the question is, what if I have a customer need that is very explicit, like, when doing the job, I need to be doing the controlling of the machine with only one hand to have the other hand free for whatever else I need to do. How would you make an ODI statement of that? Yeah, that's interesting. So that's going after the consumption chain element of interfacing with the product. We're assuming a machine, so we're assuming a solution. Um, uh, so that, that takes me down the consumption space. And what you're basically saying is um, that you want to likelihood that other work uh, cannot be accomplished when getting the job done. And uh, whether it be because you need to free up your hand or aspects of what you might need to do, you're trying to uh, create, the goal is to create an interface that doesn't require uh, handholding, <laughs> literally. Okay. Um, yeah, th thank you, Tony. Now, let me let me also give uh, a question to you that I expect that, that I all, um, very often get when we when we, when we get into this job to be done discussions and how to how to find new markets. Um, when you when you would uh, be a, a commercial company, an industry company like a, a machine a company that creates machines, machinery, um, a machinery producer, machinery engineering company. Um, and you are challenged now with innovation and then there comes this uh, kind of this, uh, this blockbuster word like blockchain or artificial intelligence. And you know you have to be innovative and you know you have to create something and do something and you get all these uh, kind of technology trends on your table and you need to do something with it. So how would you then approach uh, uh, such a challenge like be innovative as a machinery engineering company um, and uh, and make use of blockchain and of artificial intelligence, for example. How would you approach that? Well, whether it's a, a machine manufacturer or any company, uh, they're all facing the same issues. Um, trying to get a job, job executor, and then people 
uh, purchase the product and install it and stop and use it and maintain it and repair it. So, um, you know, whether you're in, you know, every market has their core, you know, computers and their product support team. So the way I look at this is, uh, you know, uh, AI uh, and any technology is simply that, a technology. It's, it's a potential solution to get more job done or to get the core job done better. So, um, you know, we looked at this years ago with uh, bear crop science, for example. This is before digital farming was even in existence. And, you know, they sell seeds and they sell, uh, you know, a whole variety of products, like pesticides and herbicides and so on. And, um, you know, the job that the farmer is trying to get done is to grow crops. So by studying that entire I discovered that there were about 50 of the 150 outcomes associated with information flow, uh, which required a digitalization solution. And so we pr presented that to them, this is over 10 years ago, uh, to show that possibility. And of course, since that time, they've made the investments that they need to help uh, with, the, with the digitalized uh, farming stream. But the, the same market, um, what you need to do is to discover your core job and then your consumption chain jobs. Where are the opportunities? What needs are unmet? Can we apply AI or machine learning or Internet of Things or whatever technology you want to pick? Can you apply it to address those outcomes? Right. Okay, fine. Um, uh, I just... Uh, uh, read through now the questions. There's one more question. If the market is very new and volatile, how ODI or job to be done can be used for the uh, SME businesses? So, uh, so if it's new or volatile, the two different you know, uh, adjectives, of course, but uh, I think you'll address it in this question. Uh, you still have to find people who are executing the job. So, you know, if it's new, you can't talk to people who've never executed the job. You'd have to people who have. Uh, this might be more of a challenge to find those people in the market. There may just be a few executors. But as a researcher, you'd have to um, you know, find them, send them to have a conversation with you, do the immersion, build up that, build outcomes, and then, um, you know, carry through the rest of the process to figure out you know, where the opportunities are and how you want to enter the market. Uh, Martin, uh, you had mentioned earlier in the segmentation, uh, how you find different se segments of people. When we're looking at new markets too, that are volatile, um, you want to uh, stack the chances of success in your favor. So what we recommend is that you look for the most underserved segment. They are generally the early adopters. And the reason is, is that they have the greatest unmet need. So if you can pinpoint who is most underserved segmentation techniques, you, um, you know, you, you have a greater chance of, of your product being uh, quickly adopted by a percentage of the population. And then you can work your way over time to those that are uh, less underserved. I'll get that. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Martin. Is there other questions? I see if she's coming in here. Yeah, um, yeah. I have to watch the time. We only have five minutes left here, uh, and uh, there are coming more questions coming in. I'm very happy for that. Um, thank you very much, everybody who brings in their questions. Uh, we will answer your questions uh, specifically each and every one. Um, also after the webinar, as I told you. Um, so thank you for your questions and keep on posting. We will not be able now to really discuss all of them. Um, hey, Mark. Martin, let me jump in with one. I see one of them. I, I like this question here, if you don't mind. Yes. Um, and it says, could you briefly comment on the difference between progress-centered jobs be done and activity-centered jobs be done? So um, I know people talk about us as activity-centered. That's absolutely incorrect. Um, uh, I think people who are talking about us in that fashion just don't understand what it is we're, we're doing. And so they've talked about us as focusing on an activity. We're not doing that. We're focusing on uh, that they're trying to get done, uh, not the activity that they're achieving. You know, it's it's not what are they doing. It's what are they trying to do. So it's a misnomer uh, that that what we talk about is at least 
jobs be done. And in fact, um, I don't, I don't know people who practice activity centered jobs be done. That's, it's, it's a fallacy. The difference between that and the Harvest Center, <clears throat> Harvest Center is, I guess, based on the approach where Clay Christensen has been pushing, you know, the job is the progress people can make. Well, when you're trying to make progress, how do you measure that progress? I think this is where the progress people, uh, you know, get it a bit wrong. Uh, they don't have metrics to measure progress. Uh, we do. This is we always focus on getting the job done better as helping the customer make progress. Uh, we're focused on the the job they're trying to get done, the job map, the outcomes, the metrics they're using to measure success. By focusing on it in this fact, we're able to measure progress. As Martin showed earlier, we can see how they're getting the job done and along what dimensions. So hopefully that's, uh, that's helpful. Martin, you want to pick another question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Tony. You know, uh, as this is a teaser session here, uh, uh, it should also give you a good, in, uh, a good understanding and a good under um, uh, insight already and inspiration what will happen at that summit when we get together, once we get together. Uh, you can see here the, the teaser slide. Uh, the summit is now postponed to June 15 to 16. Um, and uh, I will just uh, like to, to, um, uh, to showcase this here. Um, there will be pre-summit events. It will be live on stage and ODI interview session. Maybe this will also answer some questions that we get in here. What questions to bring in? How to conduct an ODI interview with a real executor? We will have a live on stage interview that will be conducted by Tony himself. Uh, and there will be the first job to be done award Europe uh, happening at the, in that summit. Uh, and there are some special conditions um, apart from, of, uh, from our package offer, a uh, special two plus one offer. I really want to highlight that we have a special cancellation condition so that you can cancel your participation up until three days before the event, um, should there be any issues. Um, especially related to, to, to Corona, to COVID. And the tickets also will, uh, will remain valid. Uh, tickets from March, where the original now, today, the original summit should have happened. They will stay, remain valid, not only for the uh, new summit uh, uh, event on June 15, 16, but also for other um, uh, events uh, that you have uh, in the Job to be Done Institute and that you can also find on the website. Um, and should there be um, any, um, any reason why we cannot conduct the summit on the June 15 to 16, nobody knows what's happening in the next weeks, um, we, will, uh, we will come up with another date for it. Uh, so uh, this is what I wanted to had, to, had to say also for my marketing uh, team, so everybody should know that. You saw also a lot of uh, uh, faces here and personalities. They come from different industries, from the insurance companies, from uh, machinery engineering companies, many different industries. Healthcare is here, Rush is here, also in the news currently with uh, great advancements to, to help out in Corona times. So these guys are all there and, and present at that summit and you can exchange with them uh, on their practical uh, experiences. Um, here is uh, also the, so to say, the schedule of all the events in the Job to Be Done Institute um, up until um, uh, up until the end of the year, uh, and uh, you can find out all of that on the website, and you will also get a handout from the webinar. Now let's finalize what I what I teased, uh, what, I, what I what I told you in the beginning, the banana innovation. Customers finally don't want the banana. That's yeah, that's a solution. But what they really want and uh, the job to be done is they want to have a snack while working at the office. And you can see that this is one group of executors where a banana producer creates value for uh, working people that have to work in the office and they want to have a snack while working. So that was actually a real job definition and a real project that Strategy did in the past. Um, yes, and finally what came out of it it was a new category, it was really a new product category, and that was the smoothie uh, uh, brought to market, in that case, by Chiquita, um, and a real example of an innovation that, that hits the market. Now, we could have a discussion on uh, what's, what's happening now. Uh, probably these people are now working in, in the home office, uh, 
uh, and probably that could be a, a, a line of thought for a banana producer how to help out those people who cannot leave home at the moment um, and to better understand those needs uh, and what makes it difficult to get a snack, to get nutrition, to get food um, in uh, times of Corona. So you can see that we can add a lot of value uh, to the to the uh, to the to the communities when thinking about the jobs to be done and what can go wrong. Um, as it will help us come up with solutions, hopefully very fast in every aspect um, that we have at the moment. Thank you very much for your interest, for your, for your inspiration, and for taking part in that webinar. Uh, it was a big pleasure uh, having you there. And looking forward to uh, seeing you in person once that is possible, most probably and hopefully uh, already in June.